one. Um, I've got this really big, long, prepared presentation. No, not really. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of background about me, just kind of tell you my life story to date. And what I really want to talk about then is, is what you guys can anticipate moving forward, because that's really way more interesting than you than what happened in the past to me. Um, grew up in Columbus and um, went to school at Bowling Green and, and decided about the time that I was going to go to school that I thought, okay, you know, I, th I think I'd like to get involved in radio. It just sounded, at that time, radio was such a, a primary medium. I mean, that was where, I mean, that's where we got all our music. I mean, you didn't know about a band or an artist until you heard them on the radio. That's the only way you had any, any access to, to, to music, you know, current music of the day. And I, I really thought that the greatest life I could imagine would be just sitting in a studio and playing my favorite songs and, and introducing them. And, and I just thought that would be the greatest job ever. Um, so went to Bowling Green, um, was studying that. And then also I was studying German because I had taken German classes in high school. And lo and behold, I ended up with a double major. And by the time I got out of school, I thought, well, you know what? Um, I think maybe this German stuff could parlay itself into a, a better job than, you know, working in radio. Well, it, it didn't. I almost got hired by the NSA, you know, the Edward Snowden agency, you know, spy stuff. Uh, almost got hired there, which would have been a kind of a freaky story if it turned out, because um, this, is not, this is back in 1979, and uh, they were going to retrain me in Farsi and send me to work at an embassy. Well, if that had been the case, that I would have been one of the hostages at the at the embassy in Iran back in 1979 and and you know who knows how my life would have turned out so uh, I got a job in radio um, about uh, three months after I got out of school and I like to see you know the, the best story would be if I just sat up here and told you it was my lifelong dream to work in radio and then you know I all my wishes and dreams came true and here I am today but it just doesn't work that way life's kind of like that I, I got a job in radio because it's the only job I could get uh, I needed a job and, and it was through then um, working initially part-time at a station in Newark, Ohio, and then my first full-time job in a station in, in Bryan, Ohio, far northwest corner of the state, that I kind of, you know, I kind of started to feel my way through the business and find out what I was good at, what I wasn't good at, what I was interested in, what I wasn't interested in. And lo and behold, I had, uh, I, I had a connection here in Dayton that I got an interview and ultimately got a job at WHIO, and uh, that was in 1981. You know, 35 years ago, I had a very uh, entry-level position working overnights where I would just sit in the studio, and once an hour, I would read the weather. Once an hour. The rest of the time, I would just sit there, and I would watch the meters, the VU meters, you know, just make sure we're on the air. And then once an hour, I'd read the weather. and. Uh, one of the other things I had to do, though, was I had to call the person that came on after me in the morning that worked with our morning show host. I had to call to wake him up. And it usually took, oh, three or four calls. You know, and, and when I was hired, they said, you know, they told me, here's what we want you to do. And they said, okay, you need to call Scott at this time. And then you got to call him back at this time. Then you got to call him back at this time. You got to call him back at this time because he keeps falling back asleep. And so, you know, I spend two weeks. Part of my job is trying to get this guy to wake up and come to work. And um, at the end of two weeks, uh, wiser, wiser uh, people finally decided, hey, why don't we uh, get rid of the guy that can't wake up and we'll just move the guy that's waking him up into his job. And so that just started a, a, a series of opportunities for me that um, then morphed in the chance to do sports in the morning. And then the guy that was broadcasting the Dayton games left and uh, I I raised my hand. I said, I want to do that. You know, I had done high school stuff in, in Bryan, and um, I said, yeah, I'd, I'd really love to broadcast the Dayton games. And the athletic director at the time, Tom Frerich, said, no way. There's no way. We don't want this guy. You know, who is this kid? And um, my boss believed in me, and he pushed for me. And uh, my broadcast partner to this day, Bucky Bockhorn, he believed in me. Even Coach Don Donaher believed in me. And they had me do a couple of auditions. and. Ultimately, then, I got that opportunity, which then 
you know, I've been doing ever since 1982 and then started doing the football and, and so on it's gone. I was in management for a little bit for about five years. I was the program director of the radio station and at that point in time my bosses said, you know, you keep trying to find someone that can do the morning show the way we want it done. And, you know, you have a vision for how it should be. You've tried to, you know, try to share that vision with them, get them to buy into it, and it just hasn't worked. Why don't you do it? And so then I've been the, the morning show host since, uh, since 2003. So my typical day uh, is anything but typical. Um, I wake up at 2.20 in the morning, and um, I'm out the door usually a little before 3, and I'm in the office by about 3.30. And that starts preparation for the morning show. We go on the air at 5 o'clock, 5 until 9. It's an all-news morning show if you've not listened. Um, you know, weather and traffic news, weather and traffic news, weather and traffic news. It's, it's all information. You know, the guy that had this dream of sitting in a studio and playing his favorite songs um, is on a show that has no music whatsoever now. Um, but but I, I love it. I love what I do. Uh, in addition to that, I still do the University of Dayton sports. And um, I mean, I had a weekend, for, uh, flew to San Diego Friday morning, was out there, broadcast the football game Saturday afternoon, and flew back yesterday, got in late last night, got up at 2.20 this morning, went in, did the morning show, and, uh, and I'm here today. And that's, uh, so my typical days are not what you would call a typical work week. Years ago when I was a student, um, at Bowling Green, everyone that worked in television and radio in, in Toledo seemed to be a Bowling Green grad. And so they'd be invited back and they, they, would, they would talk to classes like this, like you guys, okay? And they would stand up there and they would just, they just, they tried to outdo each other in telling some type of horror story that would, I think, try to dissuade people from entering the business. Maybe it was their idea of job security, okay? But they would tell the hor hor terrible stories about, you're going to work in terrible little towns. You're going you're to work terrible hours. You're not going to make any money. And you're going to starve. And you're going to have no friends. I mean, just, geez, you, oh, all this terrible. And, and, I remember, and I remember standing up there and thinking, who are you? I mean, who do you think you are? that you think that you are so special that you know you have a job and you have a career that somehow what's impossible for me and for the rest of us in this room is something you were able to pull off so the one thing i want to tell you today is that you can do whatever you want okay you can do whatever you want you can be whatever you want and the only things that are going to limit you is your ability your ability and your willingness, your willingness to put in the work, okay? Also the law. Pardon? Also the law. The law? Yeah, that oh. would stop you too. Okay, all right, okay, well, all right. You can't be a bank robber, okay, I get that. But no, the point being is that um, the people, the people that you hear say, and maybe you've got friends like that, or you know people that'll say, well, you know, hey, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and it's all political, I should have got that promotion, but, you know what, anyone who says that is really giving themselves permission to fail. You know, they're just saying, okay, yeah, you know, I can't get that job because I don't know the right people. Or, you know, I had to get out of the business because, well, it's just so, it's such a poor paying business that uh, I, I couldn't survive. Well, you're giving yourself permission to fail, all right? So, that being said, you know, if you're not good, if, you're, if you don't have any talent, you know, you're not going to succeed. You know, you're going to go as far as your talents will take you and your ability to work, okay? That's the bottom line, okay? So I don't know if this is going to inspire you, but I think it's just the bottom line truth of just how things are. I envy you that you are, you guys are in a great position right now. Um, we do a lot of, we do a lot of um, training at work still. And um, we had diversity training, okay? We had diversity training. And the diversity training that we did, it, it, it spent about like this much on race and about that much on gender. 
And 99% of it, we talked about generational diversity, okay? And in identifying generations, you guys, you guys have a name. You guys, do you guys know what generation, your generation name is? We're technically called millennials, even though No, 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 you're not millennials. You guys aren't millennials. You guys know what you are? You're digital natives. Digital natives, okay? You guys, you guys only know of a world of smartphones, of being online. That's the only thing you've ever known, okay? And as a consequence, um, the millennials, here's good news for you guys. You guys are going to be running the show. They're all going to be working for you someday, all right? Um, because you guys are just that much more savvy than even the millennials are when it comes to technology and embracing change in the future. It was interesting in that training we did, everyone believes in hard work, okay? Everyone believes in hard work. Um, you know, but if you look at like the, what they call the greatest generation, the World War II generation, my parents, um, hard work was just, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't an option. It's just, that, just how it was, you worked hard. And then you get into the baby boomers, like myself and Mr. Bernard. Hard work was, it was the right thing to do. It was kind of like a moral thing. Well, you, to be a good person, you need to work hard. And then you get into the Gen Xers where, you know, the Gen Xers, well, if, if you want to work, if you want something, work hard for it. If you have a goal, work hard and achieve it. And then you have the millennials that say, I work hard, so therefore I deserve something. You know, they kind of put the cart before the horse, if you will. And uh, it's, you know, it, it's, and that's going to hold them back. And that's why you guys are going to end up being their bosses someday as, as digital natives. And I say that, that you're in an exciting time in, uh, in, in our world and in your life and in your career potential because of how the media industry has changed. Okay. I mean, you guys probably think it sounds absurd, but it wasn't that long ago, relatively speaking, that most people got their news from thing that a kid riding a bicycle threw into their bushes. It was a, it was a newspaper. It was a newspaper that was delivered by someone riding a bicycle. Uh, and uh, that was the main source, source of news. And then you had three TV channels that had newscasts, and they had one at 6 o'clock and one at 11 o'clock, and there was nothing in between. Okay? Um, you had radio was the, was the news medium of immediacy. That was the, the closest thing you had to getting information right away was, was on the radio. But even radio stations were... Um, very diverse in how they were, you know, how they were being run, um, constantly changing, and, and so they, they weren't even perceived within their own industry as being a reliable source of information. So that's why, you know, you basically you had, you know, CBS, ABC, NBC, the New York Times, Washington Post, those were the five news outlets that were kind of shaping um, the opinions and, and you know the information that people were receiving in the country. I've seen so many changes just in the time that I've been uh, in the business and since 1979. Um, I saw our newsroom at WHIO when I first started. We had typewriters. Then we got manual typewriters. Manual just hit that key hard in order to you know in order to, to, to type a a letter on there and hit it hard enough because you had to make a copy of every news story you wrote because there was carbon paper, a thing called carbon paper, which that's how you made a copy of something. It just, it struck the paper and it had, to, had a carbon paper behind it which made a copy. We started off with that and then, boy, we had a big advancement. We went to electric typewriters. They were faster and that, you know, that was, wow, I couldn't believe it. And then, and then eventually, you know, eventually we got word processors, which were computers, but all they could do was just type. They couldn't do anything else uh, to what we have now. 
Um, and, you know, things like tape used to be, you know, tape is now a verb. It's no longer a noun. There is no such thing as tape anymore, but we still use it to, you know, say that we're going to record something. You'll still hear people say, I need to tape this or, or what have you. Uh, although maybe it's only the old people like me that stay, say that. More often we say, well, we're going to record some audio or record some video, something like that. So all these changes have taken place, and you guys are entering, you know, your high school careers and then what's going to happen after high school, whether it's right into the workforce, some type of secondary education beyond high school, and then whatever else you do. Um, you guys are, are so well primed to take advantage of a situation where news now, the, the number one source for news in America is right here. It's right here. I mean, this is, this is where people get their information. 60% um, of people in the evening have more than one screen that they're viewing. Someone watching TV at night, they're not just sitting there staring at the TV. They've got at least one other screen open. Um, and if you get into, a, a millen into the millennial generation and younger, that figure goes up to over 80% of the people. Think about yourselves. When you're watching TV at night, what else are you doing? Well, yeah, you got, you got, you got your laptop. You got. Yeah, I mean, most of you, most of you probably got two, maybe three screens open. You got something going on your phone. You got your laptop. Yeah. Okay. So that was basically like two to three screens on for like, I don't know, maybe three hours. Yeah. And then maybe the TV was on too. I maybe. Don't, I don't have cable, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, but, you know, and, and it's interesting you say that. You, say, you, you said unfortunately, but more and more people don't have cable because they don't need it. They don't need it. They don't want it. Um, you pay for it when you can just go online and watch exactly. it. Exactly. You know, people are not... People are, and you guys are, the great thing is, is you guys are thinking this way, you know. I'm, I'm trying to change my way of thinking in order to adapt to the world in which I'm now working, whereas you guys are already there. You guys are already there. Um, people at, you know, big network, okay, ESPN, okay, great success story in, in cable history. The most successful cable TV network ever. You know, even, even more, I would venture to say more successful than CNN in terms of the revenue created and the impact, you know, they've made on society. But now all of a sudden they are hurting. They are hurting and the future is looking bleak because people like yourselves, why would I, cable, why would I want a physical tether to my ability to watch something? You know, you guys aren't going to do it. You guys aren't going to subscribe to the cable. You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be paying those fees. And ESPN is really, really hurting. They've been laying off massive, massive numbers of people because of that. So if you're sitting here and you're, you're thinking, boy, my, my goal is I want to work at ESPN someday, you may want to rethink that vision, okay? You may want to rethink that vision because ESPN is really, really hurting because they charge... Enor you know, the way it works with a cable, you know, you pay your cable bill, you know, the cable company pays the, you know, the channels like A&E, ESPN, USA, whatever, they pay them X amount of, you know, dollars per, you know, X amount of a dollar goes to the different channels. Most of them are getting like two cents on the dollar, you know, something like that, and ESPN is getting like 20 cents out of every dollar of a cable bill, uh, which is a huge chunk of money. And so, you know, the cable providers who are losing subscribers because you guys don't want cable because you got other ways. You don't need all stinking cable, you know. So you're not going to pay the subscription. And then, the, you know, the companies, the Time Warners and the Comcasts, and, you know, they're not going to be able to pay the fees to ESPN. And so now you see where it's going. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a different world. 
uh, that is is here. It is here, and now the you know the, so it's more and more competitive um, to get people's attention. And, and really, what it all boils down to is whether it was you know when I started long ago using manual typewriters to type out things and record on a reel-to-reel -reel tape and then play it back, or whether it is now being able to digitally record things and edit things and, and push things out to mobile devices all over the place. The one thing that hasn't changed is what you're trying to accomplish, okay? And the thing you're trying to accomplish in the media business is no different than any other endeavor. Uh, what, what are you guys interested in doing? Just at random, tell me some things that, I'm not gonna hold you to it, but you know, what would you envision yourself doing someday? Directing. You. Directing, directing uh, stuff. Directing movies. Directing movies, okay, what about you? Uh, DJing and audio tech. DJing and audio tech, what about you? Uh, cinematography. Cinematography, you. Acting slash editing. Acting. Acting slash editing. Okay, you. <clears throat> Acting slash editing. Acting slash no idea. You have no idea. Have no idea. You know what? You're Probably the just filming. You know what? You're the smartest person okay. here. You're the smartest person here, right there. That that's the guy that, you know, pay attention to him. He actually knows what's going on. What about you? Cinematography. Cinematography. Theater. And theater. Okay. So you guys, you know what? I'm hearing a common thread. I'm hearing a common thread and what you all have in common in, in what in what you're aspiring to do. You have the same thing in common with those who want to be a school teacher. You have the same thing in common with those that want to be car salesmen. You have the same thing in common with people that want to be a, a minister, a preacher. And you know, what is that? What, what is it that the, all of those endeavors have in common? And really, it's about our basic need as human beings, which can be fulfilled professionally. What is that one thing that we all have in common? all have in common. I'm not going to add. So, Give it a guess. Uh, well, uh, we want to get money. Want to get money. I, okay. I, I don't really know because I was, I was trying to figure out what the question was. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. You know, hey, when your money's, money's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you, I think that if you had all the money you could ever want, say a rich uncle passed away and left you a big stack of cash, it would not address, it would not address this need, this need that you have inside you that you're going to be addressing with the pursuit of your career goals and ambitions. And that need, that need is to have someone pay attention to you. To have someone pay attention to you. And that's really the key to success no matter what tools you have from a technological standpoint, you know, the tools I had when I first began working in radio, you know, they seem like, you know, Stone Age stuff now compared to what I have. But my goal is still the same. You know, my success can still be measured the same way. And personal satisfaction still comes the same way. And that's getting someone to pay attention whether you're a car salesman and you want to you want to get them to hear your spiel so that you know I can say what am I going to need to do to get you behind this car today and and you buy it or if I'm a preacher standing up in the middle of the church I say hallelujah and I get people to say amen with me or if I'm a teacher and you don't fall asleep in my class or if I work at a radio station and we see ratings and that people actually listen to or if I'm an actor and I'm on stage and people applaud if I'm a director and I win an award, those are all, those are all validation of what we did. That's what we want. We want people to say, we want people to pay attention and then say, yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Oh, I, I liked it. Question. I was going to say, because like getting noticed and like, or getting paid attention is like getting noticed and liked, right? Noticed. It's 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 all about channeling your energies in the right way. I mean, let's face it. I mean, the people that you know, the people that are doing terrible things to themselves and to others, oftentimes part of it is that they were felt like they weren't getting paid attention. They weren't noticed. They didn't count. You know. You know, we it, it's a basic need we have. It's a basic need. We want to know that we count. We want to know that we matter. 
And so we look for ways to, to achieve it, and we do it. You know, what a great way to do it with your career. You know, it's a, cliche, it's a cliche, but people often say, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That's kind of true. Although when I wake up at 2.20 in the morning, I feel like I'm going to work. <laughs> now once I get there and get a cup of coffee in me, then I'm ready to have some fun. And that alarm goes off. That's, that feels like work at that time. That feels like work at that time. So, you know, to, to wrap it all up, I, I would just, I would encourage you to take the tools that you've been given from technology, to take your ability to integrate that into your career goals, and, and to go out and to the best of your talents and your work ethic, achieve what you want to achieve, okay? And uh, I guarantee you, the satisfaction you can get from doing something that you enjoy, that you feel proud of, and getting that feedback back, that, that realization, that validation that, you know what, someone appreciates it, someone cares, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's how you measure success. Now you'll measure success other ways, and financially, and awards, and things like that. But it's that, it's that internal, that internal measure of success that really is what's going to keep you going. All right, that's, those are my prepared remarks, all right? So you guys, you guys must have questions about something as you, as you consult your notes and look at the questions you were supposed to ask me. Yes? Uh, I was looking over your uh, page, and I saw one of your favorite TV shows from your childhood was Combat. What is that? Combat? Yeah. That was a, uh, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a drama. It was set in World War II about, you know, a group of American soldiers fighting in Europe, you know. So kind of like it was a basic, basically watch Band of Brothers. Yeah, it would be a Band of Brothers. It would be a Band of Brothers in black and white. Nice. Okay, yes? What's your favorite position you ever worked in the media field? My favorite position, um, you know, it's, I, I probably enjoy the play-by-play -play sports the most, and the thing that I, I enjoy most about that is the fact that it is, it's broadcasting in the now, and, 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 I, and it's the part of the morning show that I like the most is broadcasting in the now. When I say the now, it's, it's as it's happening. Uh, I, I've never enjoyed as much telling someone, well, here's what happened last night. Or, you know, I, I, I never was one of these people that wanted to be on this, doing the sports on the 6 o'clock news. And now we go over to the, the sports desk, and here's Larry, and, you know, to tell people stuff that happened. Right. I like to be talking about it as it's happening now. It just, it, I, I enjoy that aspect of it. it. I think it suits me and, and my, my skill level and my, my interest. And, now, the thing there is that, you know what, it's hard to sometimes when you're broadcasting in the now, you know, unlike being on stage, when you're on stage, you, you get a pretty good idea whether you're doing well or not, mm -hmm. okay? But, you know, when you're broadcasting, you don't know how well you're doing until after the fact. So, and, and I, I used to, I can remember if there was like a really exciting finish to a game, Scott, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where there's a dramatic ending of the game and you get done, you go, did I say anything? Did I say anything, or did I just go, ah, you know? I mean, did you know? And I, I, I can remember I, I would have to go back and I would, I would re-listen to things just to make sure that I actually said something, because you know you do get caught up in the now. Yes. You know, it's there's there's been there's been you know half dozen, you know nothing that nothing that really really you know caused. I mean, the, the, the I'll tell you that the job that made that, that I it intrigued me the most was that um, I was this I was contacted by a company that runs radio that, that owned radio stations in Eastern Europe, and this was shortly after 
the Berlin Wall came down and communism's over and now all of a sudden you've got these you know, democracies and what had previously been communist nations. And this company, they own radio stations in Berlin, Prague, Bucharest, Budapest, uh, Warsaw, a couple in Russia, and they were looking for a German speaker to run their news talk station in Berlin. And they flew me to New York and went through a bunch of interviews and it was intriguing and, and ultimately I just said, uh, I don't know if I want to take my family and just move to Europe and you know, my wife was like eight months pregnant and it, it was just, the timing was not right. And, and in, in retrospect, it would, it, I'm just, I'm glad I didn't do it, but it intrigued me. I'll say that, it intrigued me. Yes. In your opinion, does someone have to like sports to be a good play-by-play -play announcer? I think so. I, I think so because, and here's the reason why, is you've got to have a, an affinity with your audience. Okay. You, you, you know, you. Th this is not. This is not about what makes you happy. You know, the the media business is not about what makes you happy. It, it, it's about serving an audience. Uh, and and so, being having an interest in sports will just give you the affinity to be able to identify with your audience, so that you can give them what they want, because at least you have some idea what it is. I mean, I think if you don't, I think you're, you know, it'd be like it would be like singing a song in French that you're just you're just singing it phonetically, and you don't know what the words are. But you're just you're hitting all the notes, and you're saying the the correct pronunciation, but you have no idea what it means. I mean, that's not going to be a good performance as much as if you spoke French and you understood what you were saying and what you were singing. I'll tell you what, while you guys are looking up your next question, um, something else that um, it. You, get, you have to have a thick skin to do, to put yourself out there and to work in film, in, in music, in media. Uh, I know every day, I know every day, every day when I open up a microphone and I start to say something, I know for a fact that someone out there, and I don't know who they are, I couldn't pick them out of a crowd, but I know for a fact that someone's going, God, I hate that guy. And it's change is either turning the radio off or changing the station. I know it's, it, it, it's just the way it is, okay? But hopefully, those numbers will be smaller than the numbers that you know don't necessarily go, "Oh, you're my favorite," but just put up with me, okay? You know, you can't, you know, you can't please everybody. I'm sure that there's someone that hates Tom Hanks won't go to a Tom Hanks movie. Okay, but a lot of people do, so he wins. I don't know how anyone could hate Tom Hanks. Well, there's, there's probably someone out there. Hey, I don't like ice cream, okay? Yeah, you guys look at me like I got a third eye, you know? People are different, you know? <laughs> yes? What is the most complex position have you ever worked? The most complex uh, was the five years I was a manager because... Um, you know, and it's, it was very rewarding, but it was very complex because, you know, you had to have, you know, a technical knowledge about the job, you know, how, you know, the laws and the rules and the regulations and how to, but you know what, you're also dealing with people. So you're trying to, you know, to, to you're trying to lead people and manage systems, okay? You don't manage people. You don't manage people. You try, you know, if you're in a, in a role of being, you know, a manager or a supervisor, you know, you're not telling people what to do. You're, you're, you're trying to create a vision. You know, the, the whole, you know, the key to being a good leader is to convince someone to do something that you want them to do, but have them want to do it. You know, convince them that it's their idea to, to do that. It's what you want them to do, but they're buying into that. 
So very complex because of the human element. And to be honest with you, the human element is what I enjoy the most. I didn't like, I didn't really enjoy the nuts and bolts of Arbitron ratings and building clocks and all this kind of stuff that I had to do. I did not enjoy that part of the job at all. I enjoyed the people part. You know, matter of fact, I, I went through a program through a program last year at work. Here I am. You know, I'm at this. I'm at this company for 35 years, and I raised my hand for uh, to be involved in a uh, a, de a, a development program. And I told them I have no interest in being a manager, but I, have a, I very much have an interest in being a leader. And I want to lead internally, not necessarily have people that I'm hiring and firing and critiquing, but I would like to be a leader internally of my peers. You know, that's something I enjoy, and that's something I get a lot of satisfaction out of. So, Yes, sir? In your opinion, is there any job, aside from like, standard internship at WHIO or Cox Media that someone could get before they're out of high school? Um, and I totally didn't apply at WHIO while you were talking. No, I, I um, you know, to, to be honest with you, that's beyond my pay grade or, or my area of influence and expertise. I, I do know that, um, I, I think we have I think we have internships, and and not just at, for for college students, but you know internships of, uh, for for high school students and and as well. Um, the thing the thing that's changed for me is that when I first was hired, I was hired by a company you know, by a radio TV station complex, WHIO Radio and TV, which was part of Cox Broadcasting. And then Cox Broadcasting spun off radio. It was still under the same company, sorta, but I worked for Cox Radio, and radio was autonomous, and our decisions were autonomous, and everything happened, you know, autonomously. Now we're Cox Media Group. We moved our station into the Dayton Daily News building, and now we're in this huge, this huge building with massive number of people, and and all of these different media platforms, and we kind of tend to be like a battleship, it's hard to turn. So we're not as agile, I would say, as we used to be. In the previous forms of the company that I worked for, there was agility there that things like that happened more easily. I'm not saying it's impossible now, but it's, there's a bureaucracy that didn't exist in the previous manifestations. Larry? Yes, Rick. Mm -hmm. And I gave the example of HIO, and why don't you, you kind of have answered the question now a little bit, but how is it working with the radio, TV, news people working together, and I, having one advertising person represent all the It's, it's, platform? yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, we've been together for six years now, and um, it, it's still, we're still, experiencing growing pains. Um, you know, I think it's, I think from the content standpoint, um, the convergence and the sharing of resources and understanding that, you know, you've got to be a reporter for multiple platforms and that you're not really competing against each other and that if you are doing something uh, digitally that, you know, that's going to enhance your on-air product as well as what you're doing in print. And um, so we're, we're learning how to do that. The, the whole sales aspect of having people selling different things, being a, a salesperson who can sell radio ads, TV ads, newspaper ads, and be compensated, you know, that, that's still kind of murky right now. I, will, I, will, I did want to bring up, while well, you brought that up, and we were talking earlier about having multiple screens, um, you know, the convergence, which means all the different types of, plat we call them platforms, and a platform is that, you know, it's a TV product, it's a radio product, it's a, it's a mobile app, it's a, 
you know, website, it's, it's social media, you know, all this type of stuff, those are platforms. It's a way to deliver a message to a consumer. Um, our TV st station in Atlanta, Georgia, has a very, very popular um, African-American news anchor in the 11 o'clock news. And it's an ABC station there, okay? Um, Empire, I think, is a Fox, I think that's a Fox series, okay? And hugely popular series. They are able to time out their, tw they, they, this anchor sends out tweets, and the people that work there in their digital department are able to deliver her tweets during the commercials in Empire. So in other words, someone's watching, watching Empire, hugely popular show, a commercial comes on, and what's everyone do? Commercial's on, well, let's check my phone. Let's check my phone, let's see what's going on here. All right, they check their phone. Oh, I got a tweet. Hey, I'm gonna do this story tonight at 11 o'clock, make sure you tune in. Oh, maybe, okay, I'll do that. After Empire's over, I'm gonna switch over to WSB TV. So, you know, the, the different platforms can work together uh, to enhance each other. There's not a lot of cannibalization of audience. You know, the, the, the people that, that watch Channel 7 News will also look at the Channel 7 Facebook page, will also go to the WHIO website. It's not, they do it in addition, so it's not, you know, instead of type of thing with the different, uh, the different platforms. Anybody else? Sure. I mean, like, since you've been there for 35 years and you just got it in high school, I don't know if this uh, question is still relevant, but like, was there anything crucial you did to get to that job? Like anything crucial you did to get to where you are now? The big, okay, it's going to, you know, um, well, you know, I, I, I did go to college. I went to Bowling Green with college. So that was, you know, the college degree, and I'll tell people this, um, I, I do encourage, if, if college is right for you, I encourage it because um, it, it's, it's an admission ticket to get in the game, okay? It's, it's your admission ticket. They, you, you show up and they go, uh, you know, do you have a college degree? Yeah, I do. Okay, well, you can come in. And that, then, then, it's, then it's up to you about what you do thereafter. But so many people use it as a, and like the, the guy that hired me up in Bryan, Ohio. He was a crazy guy. I mean, literally was crazy. This guy was, whew. But he, he, he goes, oh, okay, young man, I know you got a college degree. That just tells me I might be able to teach you something. You know, and, and, you know, and that was his attitude was that you had to have a college degree. But all he cared about was that you accomplished that and that he felt now that you were someone that he could then teach what he felt he needed to know. So what was the key to success? The key to success, how did I get where I am? Okay, I'm gonna boil it down to two things, okay? And I, no matter what you wanna do, if you do it, you can go a lot farther than most people that are your peers. Show up, be on time. most basic thing, most basic thing you can do, and you wouldn't believe how many people can't do it. Show up to work and show up on time. Most of the people that I've worked with through the years, if they have been lost their jobs, if they've been fired, it's not because they were terrible and didn't, weren't talented or, you know, they didn't show up. Or if they did, they showed up late. Sorry, I mean, I wish I, wish I was going to give you, you know, wish I could tell you some, like, really special, bizarre thing that this was going to be the key to success. But oh, make sure you wear this specific color and you'll always get a job. Yeah, no, show up, be on time. Didn't you tell me once, Larry, that uh, several years ago that one of the things you had observed uh, with the convergence and maybe before that was that some of the younger employees were ones who were complaining the most about how, uh, gee whiz, I didn't realize I was going to have to work these hours. Uh, this is not what I signed on 
yes, or, that's that's something that's something your 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 older millennial uh, kindred will say. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what I agreed to, or that's not what I wanted to do. Um, you know, things will change. You know, so you got to be, you have to be flexible. You've got to be agile. You've got to be able to adapt to new new challenges. You know, I mean, there's one thing to be flat out lied to, where you know you get hired to be, you know, a camera operator and they hand you a broom. You know, but you know, they may say, hey, after you're done, after you're done uh, shooting this, you need to sweep up afterwards. You know, at that point in time, take the broom and sweep up, because that's, uh, you know, that's just part of the gig. Yes. Uh, I, I don't know why people would complain about having to be flexible with their hours. I mean, on the website, at the very least, the applications will literally say, requirements, be flexible with your time. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you can either, you know, this, this, this type of work, that, this type of work that you guys have expressed, many of you expressed interest in doing, um, you know, if you're a clock watcher, it's not a good job for you because it's, 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 not a, it's not a nine to five type of thing where, you know, you're like saying, oh, God, when is five o'clock going to get here? I'd be done. And you know what? I find it to be inverse, in, the inverse to be true, whereby when you work in, when you work in media, you're watching the clock, yes, but you're not like saying, come on, 5 o'clock, please get here so I can go home. You're looking at the clock and saying, oh, my God, I've only got an hour left to get this done. Or, oh, my gosh, you know, how am I going to get this done? And you know, it, it seems like there, are, there is more to do than there is time to get it done. And that, that, that's a stressor in and of itself. But to me, I think that's a more challenging a more challenging type of stress to deal with than to be sitting there and just trying to fill your day until you're allowed to leave as if you're serving a prison sentence and you're just hoping for the, you get paroled. Well, it's about 10.30 and so Larry's been here about 20 minutes longer than I asked him to be. So That's okay. <laughs> well, does anybody have a final question? <laughs> you. Yes. Can you it? <laughs> I'm standing up, aren't I? Hey, woo! No, I'll just okay. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you advice to the to the guys here. Okay, this is for the guys because you see, you know you're young in life, young in life. Okay, but I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about a crossroad. Okay, a crossroad that many of you are going to encounter later in your life. Okay, and I'm talking about the time when you're going to have to make a big decision. There's a big crossroad in your life, and when you reach there, you're going to have to make this decision, and that decision is which of the Elk and Elk lawyers you're going to look like. <laughs> I get it. I'm, a, I'm living with my choice. Okay? All right, guys, best of luck to you, okay?